I'd like to uh, begin by reading uh, from Matthew chapter 22, uh, verses 34 through 40, some very familiar verses of Scripture that um, summarize for us really everything that the Lord calls us to do in Scripture. We read uh, in verse 34, But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced <clears throat> the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Uh, love is <clears throat> excuse me, a summary of everything the Lord would, would have us to do, everything he would have us to be. And I would suggest to you this evening, it, it's really the greatest motivation that we have to share the gospel with others, to evangelize. Uh, you already heard quite a bit about uh, Alistair uh, Begg and the videos that we've seen last month. And of course, if you were here, you're very familiar with those. As he was sharing with us uh, various aspects of evangelism to encourage us in our need to be engaged in evangelism. Uh, he showed us how much those who are around us need to hear the gospel. It's not enough to be a quote-unquote good person because nobody is good enough on their own. They have to be born again of the Holy Spirit. Uh, he told us or reminded us how it is the Lord brings about this new birth. He, he does it only through the gospel. That, that's the only way. The gospel has to be sown before the Spirit will work. Uh, he told us why it is we can be confident that the Spirit will bring this new birth and that's because God has a plan to save a sheep. Uh, God wants to bring them in. As a matter of fact, uh, he has providentially, sovereignly arranged our lives so that we will come in contact with those individuals that he wants us to share the gospel with, the people he's intending on saving. Not exclusively, uh, but he will bring those people into our lives. And he also reminded us where we, in our weakness, in our helplessness, in, in our ineptness, you might say, would be able to find uh, the grace, the strength, the ability that we need to be able to do this work. If we were left up to our own resources, we would have every right to believe and to expect that we would fail. But the Lord has given to us uh, his Holy Spirit. Now this evening, I, I would like for us simply to consider a few things that the Lord might use, if he is pleased, uh, to motivate us to be able to reach out um, more than we, than we do. I suspect we all are seeking to reach out, but um, uh, perhaps a little bit of motivation will, will help us. Motivation, I think, is key. Uh, motivation is very important. Uh, without motivation, we really don't have the desire to do things. We don't have the want to that, that we need. Uh, you know as well as I that if there's something we really want to do, it's very difficult to get us to stop from doing that. And on the other hand, if there's something we don't want to do, it's nearly impossible to get us to do it, uh, at least unless uh, enough force is applied to us in order to get us to comply. And I think we know that that's true from, from our own experience. Now, the main reason I believe that we struggle with evangelism uh, perhaps as much as we do, is because we lack desire. So the question is, how can we strengthen our desire to reach out to others? Well, I've already told you the answer. We need the right kind of motivation. And here's something else that we know is absolutely true. When we have it, it's really amazing what it is that we can accomplish if we really want to because we are motivated with proper motivation. Now, what is the right motivation for evangelism? Well, you know, I think it's interesting because the answer to that question is probably different for each one of us. For some of us, it, it might be the sense of duty that uh, we know the Lord has placed upon us. For others, it might be gratitude for what the Lord has done for us. Uh, for others, 
the fear of what might happen if we don't do it for ourselves and also for others. And for others, it's love. And you know, even though the strongest motivation may be different for each one of us, I'm certain that all of these come into play at, at some level uh, in our lives. There's a whole variety of motivations, and I think all of them can help us in some way. So let's ask the question this evening, what are some of the motives that we have for doing this work? You know, not just that we might come up with, but the ones that the Lord has given to us. Now, I'd like to begin by just sharing maybe a couple of insights from Spurgeon that we um, actually saw the other night on Wednesday night and we saw on Thursday night. I'm not going to focus on what Spurgeon said, but, uh, but he did have a very important reason, a very important motive. And one motive is this is the reason why God actually created us. This is the reason the Lord made everything, really, is to give glory to Him. That's the reason we exist. That's the reason why everything exists. That's why all the people outside the church who need to be evangelized exist for God's glory. And that is what we need to be about, the reason why God created us. Paul writes in Romans 11.36, For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things to Him be the glory forever. Remember how Alistair Begg mentioned that uh, Christianity really provides the answers to the three big questions and really they all come or they all resolve into this. This is the reason why God made us. Where did you come from? Well, God made you. Why are you here? It's because he made you for his glory. And where are you headed? You know, what's, what's going to happen to you? Well, you're going to go to heaven if you're trusting the Lord Jesus Christ in order that you might glorify him forever. So God made you for his glory, you're here for his glory, and you will forever be giving him glory in heaven. That is the reason why you and I exist and everyone else. Spurgeon wrote this, God has formed us for himself that we may show forth his praise. The main end or purpose, reason for existence of a Christian man woman and child, is that, having been bought with precious blood, he may live unto Christ and not unto himself. You know, this right here, I think, describes the conflict that all of us are faced with in this world. Are we going to live for ourselves or are we going to live for the Lord? They don't have to be at odds with one another, really, because if you really accept and own the reason why you were created and find your delight in the Lord, you will find your pleasure in serving Him. So you can live for yourself if what you desire most of all is to give glory to Him, which is what we as Christians ought to be seeking. Well, why should you do what God calls you to do? Because that's why He made you. That's why he sent his son into the world to redeem you because we went off the rails. We went the wrong direction. We became rebels. The Lord sent his son so that he might bring us back to himself so that we would get back on track. Well, what is the main thing that God wants you to do, wants all of us to do for his glory? Well, along the lines of what we're looking at, I do believe the main thing and certainly the focus of the entire scripture is that we might be involved in the Great Commission that we might be involved in bringing others to know the Savior. That, that is the work he wants us to do. All of the good things we do, all of the uh, you know, being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, ultimately is that we might glorify God by bringing the lost to salvation. When Jesus summarized to his disciples what it is he wanted them to do before he entered into heaven, he said this in Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. The Lord wants us, in our seeking to glorify him, to sow the seed of the gospel, to disciple those who actually believe and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and equip them and send them into the work to continue this work. That's what we are all about. That is how the Lord would have us to glorify Him. 
So our first motive to evangelize is this is why God made us, this is why he saved us, that we might glorify him in the proclamation of his kingdom, of his gospel, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, a second motivation that we have is that Jesus has promised to help us in this work. We don't have to be afraid. Fear is another thing that gets in the way of sharing Christ with others. We're afraid of what people are going to do to us. But we've already seen this morning, I think, something that's very helpful in this. We have a good shepherd, one who loves us, one who actually goes before us into the work. He doesn't just send us out and say, go before me and, and do the work, protect me. He doesn't throw us out on the front line in order to protect him. He's the one who goes before us. John 10, verse 4. When he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. I purposely didn't read that last part of the Great Commission because I thought it fit better here. When Jesus tells them to go out or tells us to go out and make disciples of all the nations, he says this in Matthew 28, 20, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And that's why Peter, when he's instructing those to whom he writes, to be ready at all times to give a reason for the hope that is in them, which is, of course, by extension, what we are to be doing. He says to them, do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. But we don't have to be afraid because our Lord Jesus goes before us, because our Lord Jesus is with us. There is nothing that those who reject the gospel can do to us that Jesus is not willing to allow for our good. So even if they should persecute us, it will work together for our good. And of course, we, we already know very well, and we've heard several times, he even gives us the Holy Spirit to allay our fears so that we'll have the courage we need to reach others. Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.7, For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. And really what that means is that the Spirit of God will take the fear out of our hearts. But we do have to count on him. We have to trust him. We have to believe that he will. We have to step out in faith, knowing that Jesus will be with us. Sometimes we don't sense that courage until we actually do what the Lord calls us to do. And I think we know that by experience as well. It isn't until you, as it were, push through the pain barrier that the pain disappears. As long as you're on the other side of it, you've got all these worries and concerns. When you break through, the Lord gives you the boldness you're after. Now, a third motivation to do this work of evangelism is that it is our duty to do this. I already told you the Lord created us and he redeemed us for this purpose, but he also laid the commandment on us to do this. That's what the Great Commission really is all about. Now let me just remind you and myself as well that a duty is something we are responsible to do whether we feel like it or don't feel like it. In other words, even if I don't have the motivation that I need in from other sources that would make me desire to do what the Lord calls me to do, I still need to do it even if I don't feel that desire within me. We might ask ourselves the question, was, that, was it ever true of any of the disciples that, that they had to use this as a motivation for their evangelistic work? Or was it always that they just loved the Lord so much that they were just automatically doing it? Well, remember what we just read in the, motiva or excuse me, in the meditation that the Apostle Paul said regarding himself in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 16 and 17. For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for I am under compulsion. For woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this voluntarily, I have a reward, but if against my will, I have a stewardship entrusted to me. If against my will, is it possible that Paul might have to do this against his will? Well, he says that that's possible, yeah. And if it ever comes about that I feel like I don't want to do this, I need to remember the Lord has put this responsibility on my shoulders and I still need to do it. 
There may be times when it's against what we want to do, but we still need to do it, and that can form a part of the motivation to do what it is we need to do to help us push forward and actually accomplish it. Now, Paul's comments in 1 Corinthians 9 also reveals a fourth motivation, which I'd like to explore just for a moment, and that is fear. What did Paul say would happen if he didn't do what the Lord commanded him actually to do? Well, he says, for woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. Woe is me. That, that's a term we, you know, I think we've heard of quite a bit throughout our lives, but maybe don't really understand what it means uh, biblically, the idea of woe and weal. Uh, woe is, is curse and weal is, is blessing. If you were to interpret this literally, woe is me, what it means is how terrible, how horrible it would be for me if I did not preach the gospel. Not just for others, but for me, he says. Fear can be a very powerful motivation. and As a matter of fact, it's something that the Lord actually incorporates into our Christian experience because sometimes we do need that goad, as it were, to make us move forward. The psalmist writes in Psalm 111, verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments, his praises, or his praise endures forever. Now, we should ask this question, though, what does Paul mean by this? Is he saying that if he, if he doesn't do enough work, if he doesn't meet his quota of souls, at least he exposes to the gospel or that he brings into the kingdom that the Lord is going to cast him away. Woe is me, I'm going to be under the curse. No, obviously not because um, the Lord, we don't get into heaven through our works and you know, that was true of the Apostle Paul as well. Now there's a lot of different things that he could mean by this. He could mean this, that if I don't preach the gospel, if I refuse to submit to what the Lord actually has commissioned me to do and called me to do, well, things aren't going to look good for me. Uh, it could mean that I really don't know him if I refuse to serve him. As a matter of fact, he says something similar to it in just a few verses later in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 27. But I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. And there he means condemned, cast away. Uh, he had a responsibility to make sure that he was obedient to the Lord. And he wasn't doing that by himself. He had the Lord's grace to be able to do that, and he would continue to do that by God's grace because he was one of Christ's sheep. But we do need to understand that there are warnings in Scripture to help us continue to do what we need to do, even though the Lord is going to be working behind the scenes to make sure we do what it is he calls us to do. Well, that's one thing Paul could have meant by this. Or he could have been referring to the fact that if he didn't do the work that the Lord called him to do, many would perish who might otherwise have lived. And I realize that can sound strange. Is it possible that there could, people, there could be people who actually end up in hell because Paul failed to share the gospel with them or because we fail to share the gospel with them? Isn't it all really all have to do with election and really nothing to do with us at all? No, it, it's both. And sometimes in the plan of God, people end up going to hell because they don't, hear the gospel, or at least they not hearing the gospel, they, they really don't escape the judgment that is due for their sins, and so they end up in hell, but part of the reason they end up there is because they didn't hear the gospel, and we could have had the opportunity to share with them. And I think that's really, uh, again, something that Paul might have in mind here when he says, woe is me, how horrible it will be for me if on account of my not answering the call the Lord has given to me that there are people who perish who might have been saved, and again, again, that's theoretical, that's hypothetical, but he didn't want to be the cause of anyone's condemnation, and I, none of us want to be. You know, as we're going through that series on revival that um, we're doing on, on Wednesday evenings, and I would encourage everyone to come because we're reading some really good material, getting some great encouragements. There was this quote by Spurgeon which sounded 
rather strong for Spurgeon at the end of the chapter that um, was of Lloyd-Jones. But, but listen to what Spurgeon says because he says exactly the same thing here. And I'm sure the quote will be on the, the screen behind me. Spurgeon writes this. He goes, I would not say a hard word if I did not feel compelled to do it. But I am constrained to remind our brethren that let God send what revival he may it will not exonerate them from the awful guilt that rests upon them of having been idle and dilatory during the last 20 years. I don't think he's talking here about his own congregation, but I think he is talking about some of the churches around him. He says, let all be saved who live now. But what about those who have been damned while we have been sleeping? Let God gather in multitudes of sinners, but who shall answer for the blood of those men who have been swept into eternity while we have been going on in our canonical fashion, content to go along the path of propriety and walk around the path of dull routine, but never weeping for sinners, never agonizing for souls. So here's, here's another motivation, I think, uh, the fear that we could possibly be partly responsible for the damnation of sinners. It is possible that one of the reasons why there are people who are going to suffer forever is because we had opportunities and we didn't share Christ with them. I realize that's hard, but that's, again, what Spurgeon said. It's a very hard thing to say. But it is something that's true and something we don't want to be guilty of. By God's grace, perhaps the Lord will help us not to. Now, there are other motivations, more positive motivations, and let me give you a few of those. God promises a reward for those who are willing to do what it is that he calls us to do for him in this world. If we will simply be faithful to do what he calls us to do here, he promises that he will pronounce a blessing upon us on the day when we stand before him and he examines our work. Remember the parable of the talents and how the Lord entrusted talents to each of his servants and went away on a long journey. Well, obviously, we are the servants. We have the talents. The, the master is Jesus who has gone into heaven. The day of reckoning is when he returns, the day of judgment. There are going to be those who take those talents and use them, and certainly that means evangelizing. And there are going to be those who don't. But what if you do? What if you use your talents to glorify the Lord and advance his kingdom? What is he going to say to you on that day? Matthew 25, verse 13. Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Now that's something that I think all of us would like to hear on the day of judgment. Well done, good and faithful slave, from the mouth of our Lord Jesus Christ himself. All we have to do is be faithful in what the Lord has given us to do. Now, we do realize that we don't get into heaven by our works. That is a gift of his grace, freely given. All who trust Jesus Christ are going to get to heaven safely. But... The Lord is also equally clear that he will reward each of us for the works that we have done in his name and for his glory while we are here. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 11 through 15. <clears throat> for no one or no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man builds on the foundation with gold, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Now again, quickly from this passage, Everyone who has the foundation of Jesus Christ laid in their life arrives in heaven. They're all saved. But there's a difference as to what a person builds on that foundation. And that really has to do with how we use our lives for his glory. It's the same message the talents are bringing, except in this case, 
even though a man's work is all burned up, he still saves. In the case of the talents, the one who had the one talent and buried it wasn't. So it just shows us again that you can, you can be an unfruitful person and still know Christ, or you can be an unfruitful person and not know Christ, but I think it would, would be best for us not to be an unfruitful person because then we won't be entirely clear exactly where we are. At least those who were building tried to do something even though it ended up being entirely worthless. We need to make sure that we do what we do for the glory of God, but he will reward each of us for it. Another motive is the promise that God gives a blessing in this life. Now again, this is what we were looking at before the big series. I, I, again, I'm just, I keep thinking about that example of George Mueller, and you know, I've, I've, I've made reference to it many, many times, but I do think there is a reason why Mueller could pray with the faith that he did and know that God heard him. It certainly had a track record of praying and being heard and so forth. God didn't always answer right away, but God always did answer. But to pray with that kind of faith, to know that God will hear you, isn't something that I think any Christian can do. But I do think it's, it's something that as we consecrate ourselves to the Lord and we listen to him, that he listens to us because our hearts are more in tune with what he wants us to do and we're going to be asking for the things that he wants us to have because we're seeking his glory in everything we do. And here's some passages that bear that out as well. The psalmist writes in Psalm 66 verse 8, If I regard wickedness or sin in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Another familiar passage that talks about the same thing. You know, it's not that your arm is short, that it can't save, but our iniquities have separated us from you. That's why you're not listening. That's why you're not saving, because we're sinning. It makes a difference how we live. The Lord also says through Isaiah in Isaiah 66 verse 2, But to this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit, and who trembles at my words. That's the one that the Lord has regard for, and that's not necessarily true of every believer. Remember how the scripture says the Lord looks to and fro throughout the entire earth looking to support those whose heart is completely his. James writes in James 5.16, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. So what is another motivation for our sharing the gospel with others? Well, the Lord has called us to do it. And as we submit to that call and do what he calls us to do, we will find that we have more power in, in prayer because God will be listening to us. We will be the kind of person that he regards. Now, undoubtedly, one of the most powerful motivations that the Lord has given to us in Scripture is love. And that's, of course, why we read the passage that we read uh, this evening. Love for God and love for man. If we love the Lord, you know, to the degree that he calls us to love him, there is nothing that we will not attempt for him. There is nothing we will not do for him. Now, how much are we supposed to love him? Jesus says in Matthew 22, verses 37 through 38, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. This is why Jesus came into the world, so that we might love God in this way. Now, why should we love God with this kind of intensity? Well, we should because, first of all, He is God, isn't He? I mean, He is the one who created us, but even more than that, he is infinitely beautiful, infinitely glorious, and he is worthy of our love. But we should also love him because of what he has done for us. He not only created us, but he made us in his image. He didn't make us termites, he didn't make us fleas, he didn't make us dogs or cats. He made us men and women and children in his image so that we might know him. We should love him because when we were his enemies and all we had in our hearts was hatred towards him, he sent his son into the world to die for us. We should love him because he adopted us into his family and made us his children. 
We should love him because he takes care of us every single day, watches over us, protects us through the great shepherd, the good shepherd he's given to us. And we should love him because one day he is going to bring us into heaven where he will bless us for the rest of time. God deserves that we should love him in this way. And if we do love him the way Jesus tells us that we ought to love him, we will not find it difficult at all to endure that little bit of difficulty that we have to face for doing what the Lord calls us to do. The little bit of inconvenience, the discomfort, maybe the mild rebukes, maybe the strong reactions, whatever it is. I mean, Paul, you know how he was brutally beaten and stoned and left for dead and the whole catalog of things. And he gladly did it and considered it Basically, just a momentary passing, you know, suffering for Christ. And it was nothing compared to the eternal weight of glory that God had reserved for him. So love for God should move us, motivate us to endure whatever we have to endure. And, you know, it, it could be in some cases severe, but it's still nothing compared to what the Lord has planned for us. Now, if we love our neighbor, we're going to want to do, I think, the same thing. We're going to want to reach out to them. Now, how much should we love our neighbor? Jesus says in verse 39, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, we don't want to go down into hell, do we? I uh, don't think so. That's the reason why we embrace the Lord Jesus Christ, the reason why we trusted him, the reason why we're turning from our sins and doing what he calls us to do. Well, if we love our neighbors, we love ourselves, we shouldn't want our neighbor either to go down into hell. If we happen to be walking by a pool and saw somebody drowning in that pool, wouldn't we do whatever we could to save that person, that individual? And yet, there are people who around us, around us everywhere who in, are in danger of sinking down into the lake of fire forever. And what are we doing to try to save them from that which is a very real threat? We should do the same thing. We should reach out to them. Otherwise, they will perish. Now, again, we've seen many different motivations, but there's one thing that's missing, I think, to really nail this down and to make these motives actually give us the drive that they need. And that is the conviction that these things are true. And they're not just some kind of a story that somebody made up. You know, now how can these things have a stronger impact on our evangelism? We have to grow in this conviction, I think. We have to believe these things are true. That, by the way, is the office of the Holy Spirit to give us that conviction. But let's lay that aside for right now and just look at the fact that we have to believe that all these things are real. That there is a God who really did make us for his glory. That he really does want each one of us to glorify him through evangelism by sharing the gospel with others. That there is a real Jesus Christ who will go before us, who will be with us to the end of the age, who will empower us and protect us as we do this work. That he is the Lord and he really does command us. He really does call us to do this work. It's, it's not something that may or may not be true. It is absolutely true that there really are consequences for not sharing the gospel. People will perish who do not hear the gospel. We have to believe that the Lord really is going to reward those that will do this work on earth and that he really, really will bless us for doing it while we're here, that he will give us his grace, he will give us his blessing. We do need to believe that God really does love us, that he did send his son into the world for us and that he does take care of us so that we really are ingratiator or yeah, we, we are indebted to him to do what it is he would call us to do, a debt of love that we can never repay. 
And we should love our neighbor enough to save them from what we know is true. There is a hell that they are in danger of. They will go down into it unless we share the gospel with them. Now again, if we don't believe any of this to be true, if we really don't believe it, we're not going to do anything about it, are we? We're just not going to respond to it. And if we're not certain that these things are true, that all of them are true, to the degree that we are not certain, our resolve is going to be weakened. So we need to strengthen this conviction. We need to seek God's grace so that we might grow in our conviction of these things. We really need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Again, I'll, I'll bring the Spirit back in. Okay, this, this is how we see these things to be as real as they are. We have to be filled with the Spirit of God. We've already seen that God has given His Holy Spirit. On the day of Pentecost, He poured out of His Holy Spirit. He is available to us. We have a command from the Lord that we are to be filled with the Spirit of God. That is a command that we need to submit to in order that we might experience what it is the Lord would have us to do. This is where we work along with God. It's not an automatic thing. If we, if we believe it is, we'll just continue to kind of move along in life and wait for the Lord to zap us when it's His time. I think sometimes the idea of revival gives us this idea that we just need to wait for God to zap us, but we can get that zap, as it were, by personally seeking the Lord to be filled with His Holy Spirit in the way He calls us to. And I believe that we need to continue to do that before these motivations are going to be strong enough in our lives to get us to give ourselves to this work to the degree that we should. To the point where we can pray as Spurgeon prayed, and I'll just close with this. He says, oh, I pray God that I may feel that I am God's man, that I have not a hair on my head that is not consecrated, nor a drop of my blood that is not dedicated to his cause. In other words, I belong to him fully. Every part of me, more than just the hair and the, and the blood, my soul, my heart, my mind, my strength, everything belongs to him. He says, I have nothing to care for, nor to live for in this world, but that I may glorify God and spread forth the savor of my Savior's name. This, this is what it means. This is putting into other words what it is that Jesus tells us is the greatest commandment. To love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. This is what we need to attain in order to be as effective as we can be in reaching out to the lost. Because unless we love God in this way, we're not going to be reaching the lost with the kind of zeal we know that we could do for things that really do fill our hearts. May the Lord give to us um, that kind of zeal. Let's bow for a moment of, of silent prayer and then I'll close the time of, of prayer.